the ranks are thinning. And are there any questions while we're waiting? Everything was crystal clear? Yes? So, uh, from yesterday you were going to say, you said you were going to mention what BG is. I said I would mention what BG is after the lecture if you asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, wh how long do we have to start? It, it's 8.59, so it's, it's basically you know, one minute. I will minute. answer that question after the lecture if you <laughs> ask. <laughs> um, all right, so, um, so last time we... Uh, we're looking at Chern Simons theory on sigma th on a three manifold, which is a, a product of a closed compact topological surface. And in this case, uh, oriented. And so in this case, there should be a, a space of states. Uh, H of sigma 2, depending on the orientation. And um, we're, we were talking about for G equals E1. And so then the Hilbert space should depend on kappa. And so one of our goals is to understand this space very, very well. And uh, there are four ways to quantize it, and I will, all four are described in the notes, and I will uh, describe some, some of those ways. Now, some of what I'm going to be saying today actually also applies to the non-abelian theory. So, before we get started quantizing, let me just make a comment. on the uh, non-abelian Chern-Simons action. So as I said, Chern-Simons theory can be defined for any compact, any Lie group, actually. But let's uh, restrict our attention here to G, which is now a, uh, a compact connected uh, simple Lie group. Okay. So it comes from Carton's list. And so now it has a Lie algebra. And let's define a trace form on the Lie algebra. So if x and y are in the Lie algebra, let's define the trace of x times y to be minus 1 over 2 times the dual Coxeter number of the trace in the adjoint representation of add x, add y. That's a good normalization. So then the long co-roots have uh, length squared 2. And so now let, let p be a principal g bundle over m. Um, and uh, for what I'm going to say just in a moment, let's take the dimension of m to be greater than or equal to 4. Well, I'll, t I'll say it when I need it. And, um, and so then this will have a connection. So if you don't know what a principal G bundle is, locally I have a gauge field. But as I go around the manifold, I have to make gauge transformations. It's, it's not a globally well-defined form. And so now let's... Uh, Let's define P, P of my gauge connection, to be 1 over 8 pi squared trace with this normalization of F squared. F squared means F wedge F. And um, so A changes by gauge transformations. F also changes by gauge transformations. So F is also not a globally well-defined 
two form. But um, because of the trace, this is a globally well defined four form. So I'll write it's an omega four of M. And so now I'd better take the dimension of M to be bigger than or equal to four. Okay. Now there's a nice little theorem, uh, which I'm not going to prove. This is part of chern bay theory, that if, if G is simply connected, so every compact simple Lie group has a simply connected compact uh, covering, um, then the periods of P of A are integral. So remember, the periods are the integrals of P of A over various uh, four cycles inside our manifold M. If M is four-dimensional, it would be the whole manifold itself. And um, moreover, uh, for any given integer, there exists uh, P over M uh, and a connection and an A giving that integer. So it's not like secretly uh, the periods are all um, even or multiples of three or something like that. Now, an important part of what's called chern vey theory is that these periods do not depend on A. So if I have two connections, if I have A1 and A2 in the space of all connections, of my bundle over M, the space of all gauge fields, if you like, with a fixed topological type of gauge field. If you don't like bundle language, you might say it that way. Then uh, the difference between P of A1 and P of A2 is exact. I mean globally exact, not locally exact. So there's a globally well-defined three form called the relative churn simons form. So, okay, so this is called the relative Chern Simons form. And I want to stress that it's globally well defined. So, often in physics, we write D of something that isn't globally well defined. Like I was doing that myself yesterday when I was writing F equals D of A. And then I would start talking about non-trivial first churn class. Well, that would mean that A is not globally well-defined. If A were globally well-defined, F would be exact, and then the integrals, the periods of F would be zero. So in physics, we do this all the time. But I'm being very careful here. This is globally well-defined. In fact, I'll write down a, a formula for it. So. Um, so you should know that the space of connections on a bundle over any manifold is what's called is an affine space. So that means it's like a vector space, an infinite dimensional vector space, except that it doesn't have any origin. So if you choose some connection, then every other connection, let's call it a a1, every other connection, A2, can be obtained from it by translation by a vector in a vector space. In, that, in this case, the vector in the vector space would be the vector space of all sections of what's called the adjoint bundle. So this is a globally well-defined uh, one form valued in the Lie algebra locally. Okay. So it's so if I have two connections, I could call them A and A plus alpha. And here's the formula. 
So this is 1 over 8 pi squared times the trace with the normalization I just gave, 2 alpha f plus alpha dA alpha plus 2 thirds alpha cubed. Now, you see, this is manifestly globally well defined because everything here is transforming in the adjoint representation, so I'm taking a trace. Alpha is globally well defined. The f is also globally well defined two form in the adjoint bundle. This is the covariant derivative of alpha and alpha cubed. So that's what you really get. You only really get churn uh, when bundles are non-trivial. You only really get relative churn Simons forms. Now, but we want to write something like uh, the integral over a three manifold of trace of ADA plus two thirds A cubed. But if, uh, if P over M3 is non-trivial, or any M is non-trivial, then um, the trace of ADA plus 2 thirds A cubed is not globally defined. Okay, if you tr if you look at how this transforms across tra uh, patch boundaries, it's not going to match up. Now you might say, well, why not just take churn Simons of a comma zero? Does anyone know the answer? I just finished telling you that the relative churn Simons is globally well defined. Now I'm saying there's a problem with just trace of a d a plus two thirds a cubed. So What's, what's the point? So why, why, not, why not just put A equals zero? Any, any ideas? Yes? Well, A equals zero would be globally well defined, wouldn't it? What is zero? Ah, you're onto something. What, 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 what? Yeah, sorry, say, say. Well, no, that, that's, that's, no. Uh, um, so so I, I, thought, I thought they were onto it. Um, so uh, zero does not remain zero under gauge transformation. Yeah, that's, 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 that's true, but not relevant. Yes, the other, quest, the other comment, which was more on the line of, which was on the right track, was what is zero? Yes? Zero is only the connection for the trivial point. Man's got it. So. Um, so his comment was, zero is only a connection on the trivial bundle. So that's exactly right. So you see, you, uh, I don't think people, well, I just proved it. People don't generally appreciate this. If you have a non-trivial bundle, it doesn't make sense to write A equals zero. It doesn't, that's, not a, that's not a valid connection on a non-trivial bundle. After all, I just told you, I just said here that the integrals of P of A are topological invariants. If I had a bundle and I could put A equals zero, then the integral of P of A would be zero. So if I can find a bundle where the integral of P of A is not zero, that's called an instanton, then I know for sure I cannot find a zero. That's why I said it's an affine space. There's no natural origin. There's no zero. Okay. Nevertheless, we want to do this. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, there are actually three ways to define it. I'll tell you one of them. I'll say one way to define this is to extend. So this fits in well with what I was saying in lecture two. So we, we take M3. We Take an extension of the bundle with connection. And again, you have to check that there are no topological obstructions to that. In low enough dimensions, that's OK. OK, and so you define the integral of M3 of trace of ADA plus 2 thirds A cubed. And let's put in the 1 over 8 pi squared. And so then that's the integral of P of A. Now, P of A, that is 
a perfectly well-defined gauge invariant globally, globally well-defined thing. So this really exists as a real number. But if we're trying to define a theory in three dimensions, and we don't have, as part of our physics problem, the, the data of an extension to four dimensions, okay, then, then we don't wish our action to depend on the choice of W4. So just as in the arguments yesterday, there could be another W4 prime that somebody else could try and use, and that other person will get a different real number. However, the difference is the integral over a closed form manifold, and then I told you that the periods are integral. So the integrated chern simons action in general is an element of R mod Z, not a real number. Okay. So now in the non-abelian case, we want to write 2 pi i times 1 over 8 pi squared, the integral with this trace of a dA plus 2 thirds a cubed, where we now understand that this is not a real number, it's an element of r mod z, and therefore if we put a k here, we're only going to have something well defined when the level is an integer. Yes, question? Okay, the question was, alpha is a globally well-defined one form up to conjugation, or what is going on? So, uh, so given, given a principal bundle, a principal G bundle over a manifold, there's automatically a vector bundle associated to it called the adjoint bundle, where the fibers are the adjoint, the Lie algebra itself, the adjoint representation. And, this, and the transition functions for the adjoint bundle are indeed conjugation. If you, so if you have patches, you have uh, u alpha and u beta, and you have some section s alpha and some section s beta, then on the intersection, u alpha beta, then s alpha will be g alpha beta inverse s beta, uh, s, uh, g alpha beta. That's true. That's just bundle theory. Okay? But so alpha is globally well-defined section of that bundle. So alpha is going to have transition functions like this, but so does f. So when I take the trace, those overlaps go away, and this is a globally well-defined three-form. OK. All right, so now I've, now I've uh, I guess I've fulfilled part of my contract, which is to, uh, to explain to you something about turn simons including non-abelian theory. So now you know at least what the action is. So now we're going to go back to the problem we were starting to address at the end of last lecture, which is again, M3 is sigma 2 times R, and what's the Hilbert space of states? So. Well, we take A, and now we have a decomposition of A into the spatial part and A naught. And here, I'll write it in the non-abelian case. This here in the box becomes exponential i k over 4 pi times the integral dx naught times minus the integral over sigma 2 of the trace of a sub s d naught a sub s plus 2 integral over sigma 2 of trace of a naught f of a sub s. All right. And as we said last time, we conclude from the fact that this is a first order action that the, that the path integral is really a path integral in phase space. And what is our phase space? Our phase space is the space of all connections on p over sigma 2, that's where a sub s lives, or if you prefer, the space of all gauge fields. All right.
So what's the symplectic form? Well, I told you last time you vary the action to find the symplectic form. So what's the symplectic form? So omega is equal to k over 4 pi times the integral over sigma 2 trace of delta a sub s wedge delta a sub s. Now, what is delta a sub s? Well, I'm now doing infinite dimensional symplectic geometry. So delta a sub s you should think of as a cotangent vector to the space of all gauge fields. So a sub s, so a sub s itself is a one form on space on sigma 2. Delta is a uh, exterior derivative along the infinite dimensional space of all gauge connections. So we're doing symplectic geometry in an infinite dimensional phase space. Um, now, if we did it for the abelian case, g equals u1, then in terms of the kappa we had before, it looks a little different. Uh, we have the integral of delta a sub s wedge delta a sub s. OK, so there's a relationship between, a sub a, uh, between kappa and k if you specialize. Um, well, I restricted myself to simple, simply connected uh, uh, Lie groups. Incidentally, I forgot to say, um, this theorem is false if I drop the simply connected. That's quite important. So if I talk about SO3 instead of SU2, right? SU2 is the double cover of SO3. If I talk about SO3, then this, these integrals can be uh, fractions with a fourth. Okay? In general, if I take a, if I do, uh, so in Yang Mills theory, what's the gauge invariance of the action? It's not SUN, it's SUN mod ZN because the gauge field is in the adjoint representation. And then you'll, you'll get these, these, these periods for SUN mod ZN will be in one over, will be fractions with 2N in the denominator. So the simply connected is very important there. All right. Um, OK, so, so this is the case with our, our simply connected um, uh, compact Lie group. This is the case with U1. And I remind you that in U1, A sub S is a real field in my normalization. All right, so now we want to we wanna quantize this phase space. So um, the integral of dA0 implies that we're going to look at flat fields. And then we need to divide by spatial gauge transformations uh, from sigma 2 into g. So this is an, a problem which in symplectic geometry is called Hamiltonian reduction. or symplectic reduction. The latter term is more common in mathematics. And uh, so now I'm going to take a little time and explain what that is. So quite generally, suppose that P omega is a symplectic manifold. So P is a manifold, omega is a symplectic form. And suppose that G is now a Lie group acting symplectically. So G acts on, on the manifold, and the symplectic form is invariant for all G and G. OK, now if G is a continuous group, and X is in the Lie algebra, then we can take a one parameter family of G's. And that induces some flow on my face space. And so there's a vector field, V of X is a vector field on P.
Okay. Now, because a g sub t star of omega equals omega, that implies that the Lie derivative with respect to x of omega is zero, and the Cartan formula for the Lie derivative is d contraction plus contraction d. But um, omega is closed, it's a symplectic form, so that means d of iota of x of omega is zero. And so that implies if, let me assume that h1 deram of p is zero, which is certainly the case in the space of gauge fields, it's an affine space, so that means that uh, iota of x omega is exact. So this has to be d of a function, right? So omega is a two form. Contraction with a vector field gives me a one form. So I have a closed one form. And so it's got to be an exact one form. So there's some function. I'll call it mu of x. So this is a function from p into r. And mu of x is only going to be defined up to a constant, but that's OK. Now, iota is, is linear on the Lie algebra. So my function, I can choose my constants so that my function is linear. And to give a family of functions for each element of the Lie algebra on your manifold, is the same thing as giving a map from your manifold into the dual of the Lie algebra, because you, if you contract with a vector field, you get a function. So this is very famous in mathematics. It's called the moment map. And let me give you two examples to show you why it's called the moment map. All right, so the first example, let P just be the cotangent bundle of Rn. So we'll have points Qi and Pi in there. And let G be Rn acting by translation on Qi. So if a is a vector here, then qi pi just goes to qi plus ai pi. And so now the Lie algebra is again Rn with the zero bracket. So if g of t is the exponential of t times some vector, let's say alpha, then what does it do? It takes q vector p vector goes to q vector plus t alpha vector p. OK, I'll skip a few steps. I want to save some time. You can figure out the rest. Mu of this Lie algebra element alpha is equal to minus alpha i pi. Let's call that an exercise. All right, so that's the momentum. That's why it's called the moment map. This function is the momentum. If I give you an element of the Lie algebra, I get the momentum dual in the direction dual to alpha i. Let's do a second example, very similar. Uh, let's again take uh, the cotangent bundle to Rn, standard symplectic form. Now let's uh, embed GLnR into the symplectic group 2nR. And let's embed it by A goes into A a transpose inverse. So I, I change my q's by a and my p's by a transpose inverse. That preserves the symplectic form dp dq. Here is an explicit one parameter family, 1 plus t e i j, where i is not j, and that's the matrix element. That's the matrix unit with a 1 in the i throw jth column and everything else is 0. So what does this do? I'll let you figure that out. It takes q goes to q plus t q j e i and p goes to p minus t p i e j. 
And I'll let you work out that mu of this Lie algebra element Eij is equal to minus QIPJ. So therefore, if I further restrict to SON in here, then mu of the generators Tij of SON, that's Eij minus Eji. So what's that going to be? That's going to be QJ PI minus QI PJ. This should start to look familiar. So now if we specialize even further to T star R3, then mu of the generators of SO3, which is 1 half epsilon IJK, TJK, is equal to angular momentum. OK, so the moment map is momentum or angular momentum in these two examples. That's why it's called the moment map. OK, so now, now we have, whenever we have a, a group acting symplectically on a, on a phase space, we can, uh, we can define something called Hamiltonian reduction or the symplectic quotient. And this is how we do it. Is there a question? No. OK, this is how we do it. So um, for convenience, uh, convenience, uh, choose a non-degenerate form on your Lie algebra so that you can identify the dual of the Lie algebra with the Lie algebra. And so we can confuse those two. So then mu of g dot x, we'll think of that as being now valued in the Lie algebra. And now you can, you can see that this is equal to g inverse mu of x g, another exercise. So it changes by adjoint under the group action on x is in my phase space. So therefore, if I choose a, an element in the center of the Lie algebra, these, uh, in, the, in the applications of supersymmetric field theories, these would be Faye-Iliopoulos terms. That's why I call it zeta. It's often de denoted by zeta. Then uh, S of zeta is, by definition, the points of x and p such that mu of x equals zeta. And because zeta is in the center, and because of this adjoint property, this is preserved by the g action. So g acts on this. OK, so now here's the, here's the picture. So here's phase space. We're looking at some slice here, s of zeta. And then there's g acting on this slice. Preserves that slice, s of zeta. OK. Now, the pullback of the symplectic form is degenerate, but we have a very nice theorem. In mathematics, it's got associated with the name marston Feinstein, which is that S of zeta modulo g is a symplectic manifold. So it has a symplectic form omega bar. And if I take pi, it goes from S of zeta projecting down to S of zeta mod g, taking j gauge invariant objects, then omega in the neighborhood of S is omega bar plus d mu a times theta a for some one form theta a. So let me give you an example of this. So our example is our phase space will be complex number space n plus 1. Our symplectic form will be just be the standard one. So um, this will be uh, dxa dya if I choose my complex coordinates in terms of real and imaginary parts to be xa plus iya. So now I need to choose a U1 action on this, and I will choose the following U1 action. ZA goes to e to the i theta 
times ZA. So I, I just scale all the ZAs by phase theta. And so clearly they cancel out here. So this is a symplectic action. And so I'll let you work out the, so here's an exercise. Work out that the moment map is I times the sum of ZA squared. And so S, if we choose, um, U1 is, is already an abelian Lie algebra, so everything in U1 is, is, um, is central. So if I choose I times R squared, where R is a real number, then what is this? This is Z such that the sum of ZA squared is R squared. Okay, so um, what is that? Does anybody recognize that? That space, that manifold? What's the solution to that equation as a manifold? Anybody? Well, look, uh, imagine that you plugged in the real and imaginary parts here. Do you recognize that equation? <laughs> sphere, I like to hear sphere, yes. So this is, this is isomorphic to um, the 2n plus 1 sphere. Good, and so now, this projects over S of I R squared mod U1. And what is that space? CPN. So I mentioned the hop bundle yesterday. So if you put N equals, uh, N equals 1, then you get the famous hop vibration. And this is a generalization of the hop vibration. So another exercise you might want to play with, if you want to get familiar with this, is here's another U1 action. Take ZA goes to e to the i QA, no, e to the i theta to the QA power times ZA, where QA are just some integers. And ask yourself, when is this a compact or a non-compact manifold? When is it singular? What kind of singularities are there? So I could just, see, I, it's perfectly legal. These are other U1 actions. OK? And um, this is the kind of thing, again, you meet, you, you meet quite frequently in supersymmetric field theory when you're working out the classical uh, vacuum moduli space. Uh, speaking of which, if I had chosen instead of a negative number here, I would have had a negative number here, and then there wouldn't have been any solutions. Okay. All right, back to churn simons so we're going to apply all this to uh, turn simons theory. So here's our symplectic form. So we have this infinite dimensional affine space of connections. It's a symplectic manifold. And we're going to do symplectic reduction. So let's go. So first off, how about writing down the Poisson brackets of our gauge fields that follow? that follow from that symplectic form. So those would be AI, A of X, AJ, B of Y is 2 pi over K, epsilon IJ, delta AB, delta 2 of XY. OK, so what are my coordinates, if you like, on this infinite dimensional manifold? They're the values of the connection uh, in the direction i in the group space direction a at the point x. So I've got an infinite number of coordinates. Those are coordinate functions on the manifold, so they have Poisson brackets. So this is the Poisson brackets that I get from that. Uh, i here are uh, the two spatial directions. Epsilon ij, well, you have to choose an orientation. I'll choose that. And the ta's are the, the uh, the A sub A's are relative to an orthonormal basis with respect to that trace, which I carefully defined uh, normalized for you before. OK, so what's, what's the group, the Lie group, that's going to be acting symplectically on this space? That's the group of gauge transformations, G, which in general is the automorphisms of the principal bundle. But if P is trivializable, That's isomorphic to maps from sigma 2 to G, spatial gauge transformations. 
You could check that x symplectically. And what's the Lie algebra of this? Well, it's the set of functions which go from sigma 2 into the finite dimensional Lie algebra. And now, what do you think? Uh, so I told you that for every element of the Lie algebra, it's still on the board here. For every element of the Lie algebra, I get a vector field on P. So for such an infinitesimal gauge transformation, I'll have a vector field V of epsilon. And that's a, one for, that's a vector field on the space of gauge connections. And now acting on a one form on the space of gauge connections, what do you think it is? So this should be a zero form on the space of gauge connections. And what it is, is it's the infinitesimal gauge transformation. Okay, of my of my field A. So this is equal to D epsilon plus A commutator epsilon. All right, so now I have my epsilon. I know what to do. Um, I have my, sorry, V of epsilon. So now um, here's the formula I need to apply that defines the moment map. And so the moment map, mu of epsilon, I could go through the steps to prove this, but I, I write out every step in the notes. So I'm going to skip it. I'm just going to say what the answer is. It's k over 2 pi times the integral over sigma 2 of the trace of epsilon f. OK. Now with the moment map, we can do symplectic reduction. Now we have to choose a level. We have to choose an fi term, if you like. We have to choose a zeta. Now we already know that from this form of the action, integrating over a naught is taking us to the flat gauge fields. So we're going to choose the level to be 0. OK, so our reduced phase space, let me write it over here. So for gauge theory, the reduced phase space is m flat equals the gauge connections such that f of a equals 0 modulo the group of spatial gauge transformations. And by this general theorem, we know that this has to be a symplectic manifold. And this is the manifold we want to quantize to find the space of states in chern simons theory. OK? So now, how do we quantize uh, how do we quantize in this situation with Hamiltonian reduction? Well, there are two things, there are two routes you can follow when, you, when you're doing Hamiltonian reduction and you're trying to quantize the phase space. And both of the routes are actually quite useful and, and informative. One thing is you could quantize on A on curly A, and you replace Poisson brackets by commutators, and impose F equals 0 as an operator equation. So now the A's become operators. So A is an operator. So F of A hat is an operator. And I have psi. And I impose this as an operator equation. Then I, I make sure, you, even globally, psi is a gauge invariant wave function. Um, so this leads rather directly to the WZW path integral, as I describe in the notes. But I'm not sure I'm going to get there. Because we're going we're gonna to start to uh, take the second point of view, which is to work directly on the quotient m flat. And then I discussed in, in yesterday's lecture the various tricks you can use to quantize phase spaces. As I said, there's, there's no general prescription to quantize a phase space. You have to give some extra data. And we talked explicitly about Kähler quantization, and that's going to be one of the 
ways we're going to do it. OK. Now, again, there's an obvious question. Why doesn't someone answer, ask it? Maybe you'd answer it, too. What's the obvious question, given what I just said? Good morning. <laughs> Does 1 and 2 give the same answer? OK. Um, I don't know of a guarantee uh, in the case of Chern Simons theory. Uh, it does, but um, I'm not, I don't know of any theorems that guarantee that in Hamiltonian reduction you're always going to get the same answer. Of course, if you don't, then something weird is going on. All right, so now I'm going to take some time to, now I'm going to take some time to talk about the space of flat gauge fields. Okay, because we, should, we need to understand this space a little bit. because we want to quantize it. So while I'm erasing, are there any questions? So I'm going to start, again, very general, trying to give you general lessons that you can apply, not just in turn simons theory, but in lots of other contexts. So let's talk about flat gauge fields. All right, so let's start generally. So let, let P be a principal G bundle over any X. Any manifold X, uh, P is a principal G bundle, G is a Lie group. OK, now I think you saw in Tom's talk, he talked a little bit about, about path-ordered exponentials. So we could talk about something called the holonomy. We choose a base point, we choose a loop. I'll write this as uh, gamma is in the base loops of X. And we can define the holonomy around the loop at the point X0 to be the path ordered exponential of A. And you should think of this holonomy as a, as a map from the space of all gauge fields times the space of base loops at X into the Lie group G. And we've, um, in order to do that, we chose a trivialization of our bundle at X0. Now, uh, put differently, the holonomy at x0 of A gauge transformed by G only depends on the value of the gauge transformation at x0 and satisfies this identity. So I don't really care about my trivialization of my bundle, or um, so I don't care about my trivialization of my bundle. So what's, what's, what's really defined here is something into the conjugacy class. Only the conjugacy class is gauge invariant. Similarly, if I have another point in the same arcwise connected component of x, I can compose with a little path like that. And again, my holonomy function only gets conjugated. So what's interesting is the, the map to the conjugacy classes. So here's a theorem. So the holonomy of x0 from omega x0 to x to the conjugacy classes of G, consider this a function of A. In other words, given a connection, I have a, a, a map from the base loops into the conjugacy classes. This function is a complete gauge invariant. In other words, there exists a G, a gauge transformation, from X to G such that A prime equals A gauge transformed by G if and only if there exists, this is G in curly G, if and only if there exists a G naught in finite dimensional G such that the holonomy at X naught of A prime gamma 
is G naught inverse holonomy of X naught of A gamma uh, G naught, where G naught does not depend on gamma. And this is true for all gammas. So I couldn't figure out where to look this up. So I gave a proof in the notes. And I'm not terribly proud of it. So if somebody knows, knows of a, a more elegant proof, please let me know. All right, so theorem two. Suppose that I have a flat gauge field, f of a equals 0. Then this holonomy function, a gamma, descends to a function on the class of gamma in the first homotopy group of x based at x0. I'll give a proof of that on that. Actually, I'm short on time. I'm, there's a proof in the notes. It, the variation, OK, the, the, the idea is, is this. If I, if I vary my loop by just a little bit, then the difference of the holonomies is an infinite series in the curvatures and their covariant derivatives. OK? And therefore, if the, if the gauge field is flat, it doesn't depend on small variations of the loop. I give a more careful proof in the notes, but I'm, I'm short on time, so I'm going to skip it. The proof on the board. All right, so what do we learn? We learn that m flat is equal to the space of all group homomorphisms from the fundamental group based at x0 into g modulo g, which is acting by conjugation. So you see, if I have a homomorphism phi that takes a um, a class gamma to phi of gamma, I can change phi by g by um, defining this to be equal to g inverse phi of gamma times g. That's the conjugation action. So that's how, so g acts on this space of homomorphisms. That's the moduli space of flat gauge fields. Any x, that's not three dimensions, anything, um, any Lie group. That's, that's the formula, always. Now, this space can be finite dimensional. So um, a positive dimensional, excuse me, positive dimensional. So supposing that, um, supposing that pi 1 has generators, say gamma i, i equals 1 up to some n, and relations on the generators, r sub a, where a equals 1 up to some m. Okay? Then I can specify uniquely a homomorphism by writing phi of gamma i equals g i in g. Oh, in g. Okay? So if you want to define a homomorphism, okay, from the fundamental group into a group G, here's how you do it. Find a set of generators and just choose a group element for each generator. By the definition of a generator, if you need to know what phi is for anything else, it's a word in the generator. So if you have uh, some other word, gamma i1 through gamma ik, and you need to know what phi of that is, well, it's clearly equal to g i1 through g i k, because you're trying to make a homomorphism, right? But there's a, there's a potential snag here. Does anyone see the snag? Pardon? Torsion no, not the, the, the answer was torsion elements. That's not what I'm looking for. Well, OK, I mean, yeah, in a sense, you're right. Um, sorry? There we go. Um, that's the answer. I, the answer that Roman uh, gave was um, uh, RA is, what is RA? Uh, these are words. In the gamma in the gamma i's. So, in when we have relations, that means the group is defined by putting those words equal to one. The identity, the homomorphism, always takes one to one. So therefore, if um, if this is an R a, this had better be equal to one. Okay, so you're not allowed to choose G i arbitrarily. You have to choose them compatible with the generators. So what does that mean? That means that we can view hom of pi 1g 
as a subset of Gn. What subset? The subset defined by setting those products of the, uh, uh, the words in the GI that define the relation to equal to 1. Supposing I have a matrix group. What am I doing? I'm writing polynomial relations on the matrix elements. Right? If I have, if all, think of the GIs as matrices. They have matrix elements. And now I'm saying this product of these matrices is equal to 1. So that's an algebraic equation on the matrix elements. So this is some algebraic variety in Gn. All right, so algebraic varieties typically can have singularities. Independently of that, we also have to quotient by G. Now, that can give orbifold singularities, but it also can give worse singularities. For example, notice that we always have the trivial homomorphism that sends every gamma to the identity. That's a homomorphism. There's no arguing with that. But notice that it's fixed by conjugation action of G. So the entire group fixes that point. So that can typically be a very singular point in the quotient. This is why the, the mathematicians use the word stack when they talk about the um, moduli spaces of flat connections and other things. They use the word stack because you can have these very different kinds of singularities from the quotient by the group. Uh, if G is a continuous Lie group, notice that this is, this is much worse than an orbifold singularity. An entire G orbit is being, is being collapsed to a point. Now, what's a criterion for when we're at a nice smooth point? Suppose that um, suppose G has a faithful representation R. So we have a, a homomorphism into GL of V of some representation space. Then if I have a phi, I can compose the two. So if I have a representation of G, then I automatically have a representation of pi. Okay. Now, if this representation is irreducible, if irreducible, we have what's called a stable point. And then you can expect M-flat to be a smooth manifold in the neighborhood of a stable point. OK. Let's now go back to the special case where x is a two-dimensional topological surface. And think about the space of flat connections on that. So we take x is now sigma 2 is a topological surface. OK, and, and for what I'm going to say, we could also add punctures. I think I got chalk, colored chalk yesterday. OK. Um, and so let's suppose that uh, Suppose that there are some punctures here. Now we choose a base point, x0. And then there's a natural set of generators. I could choose a1 here, b1 here, then a2 here, b2 here. Whoops. And then I could also choose. Some loops around the punctures. Uh, do I give them names? C1 through Cn. So there's a theorem in math that those kinds of loops, the homotopy class of those kinds of loops, generate the fu fundamental group. And there's only one relation. So pi 1 is equal to A, is generated by Ai, Bi, and Ci with just one relation, the group commutator 
of a i and b i. This i is going from 1 to genus. And then the product from i equals 1 to n of c i is 1. That's the relation. So that's the fundamental group of a punctured Riemann surface. I said Riemann surface. I meant topological surface. I have not put a, topolo I have not put a complex structure on this. It's a topological surface. All right, so now what do we do if we want to write a homomorphism? Well, we just choose some matrices, or more generally, group elements. OK, so these are all elements in G. And so the space of homomorphisms is uh, just literally the set of tuples of group elements such that, again, the, commutator, the group commutator, group commutator of these matrices, these are all invertible matrices because it's in a group, that's the group commutator, is one in the group. So, okay, so now if G is a, a positive dimensional Lie group, you can actually try and count the, um, the dimension of M flat at a smooth point. Okay, at a singular point, it, it would be tough to make sense of the dimension, but at a smooth point, well, what do we have to do? We have to to choose 2G plus N different group elements. Okay, so we have that times the dimension of the group. And then we imposed one relation, so that's minus dimension of G. And then we take a quotient by the G action, and that's another minus dimension of G. And so this is equal to minus the Euler character of sigma 2 times the dimension of G. Okay, so I have this positive dimensional, in general, positive dimensional space. All right. Oh, wait, I think I still have some board over here. All right, so if I'm at a, if I'm at a smooth point, then you can show and I'll explain it to interested people after the lecture. If you're, uh, but this can be expressed in terms of group cohomology of pi 1 of G in the adjoint representation of phi. So this is the, um, I'm saying this because group cohomology is really fashionable and cool these days. So I thought you'd like to see uh, some group cohomology. So here's some group cohomology. So, um, so you, can, you can define group cohomology with values in a representation of that group uh, by this exactly this kind of maneuver, there's always the adjoint representation. So I can compose that. So that gives me a representation of pi 1. And the, um, the tangent space is naturally like that. And then except for the sphere, uh, this surface is what's called a k pi 1. So that hi of the group, uh, whatever, whatever it is, also hi of the surface. And so we can uh, define a symplectic form by taking this to H2 of pi g in the adjoint representation. And then you can take a trace and integrate, and that gives you r. So that's the intrinsic definition of the symplectic form. That's, I told you there was an omega bar. In fact, it's still on the board here. In this symplectic quotient, uh, theorem, there's an omega bar, OK? It's, this is not an obvious formula. This was discovered by William Goldman. And to give you some sense of, of what, it, what it's doing, let me, let's take some Poisson brackets of some interesting functions, some interesting functions on the space of flat gauge fields. So what's an interesting function on the space of flat gauge fields? So fix a representation. R of G, um, and then consider the Wilson line. So W of R, gamma, and uh, A is the trace of R, path ordered exponential, integral around gamma of A. OK, so, uh, sorry, fix a representation R and gamma in pi 1. Then for fixed R and gamma, this is a function on m flat. And I just turned m flat into a symplectic manifold. So I can ask, what 
is the what is the Poisson bracket using that symplectic form of these Wilson line functions. So WR of W of R gamma 1 symplectic sorry Poisson bracket gamma 2 is equal to a sum okay so what do you do is you take representatives specific curves gamma 1 and gamma 2 and you have a sum of terms over the intersections so there's an explicit formula gamma 1 transverse intersection gamma 2 of what's called the oriented intersection number define it in a moment times trace of something local at P and it's in the notes what is the oriented intersection number? These are oriented loops, and I have an orientation on my, on my uh, uh, surface, my topological surface. So if I'm at an intersection point, and I use the right-hand rule, so if gamma 1 with gamma 2 agrees with the orientation of the surface, so I'm choosing the blackboard, natural blackboard orientation with the right-hand rule, then I of P is plus 1. And if I choose the other one, the other orientation, then I of P is minus 1. So something should uh, strike you as weird here. This only, the left-hand side only depends on the homotopy class. Over here, I actually had to choose representatives. I could choose a completely different representative, okay, with a totally different set of intersection points, and then I'm going to get the same answer. That's non-trivial. Pardon? The, the we're only doing, we're working with gauge fields on two dimensions. The question was, uh, are the Wilson lines confined to the surface? So he's, he's thinking three dimensional, uh, which ultimately we're going to do. But right now we're just discussing gauge fields on a surface. So, so there is no third dimension. All right. So now let's, let's uh, this is all very difficult. So let's speci specialize to G is U1, and things get a lot easier. Okay, so if I have a homomorphism from pi 1 into G, then it descends to a homomorphism from H1 into G, and then M flat is homomorphisms from H1 of sigma 2 with Z into U1, uh, Everything is abelian, so I don't have to worry about the quotient by, by uh, conjugation. And this is isomorphic to H1 of H upper 1 of sigma 2R minus mod H upper 1 of sigma 2Z. Okay, and so this is a 2G plus N dimensional torus. Actually, we could have gotten here if this is all we wanted to do, we could have gotten here a lot faster. So let me indicate how that goes. So if I have a U1 gauge field and it's flat, so that implies that F equals dA, where A is globally well-defined. Moreover, A is closed. So A is in omega 1 closed. So it defines a first order cohomology, uh, degree one cohomology class. But then gauge transformations, remember, shift A by A plus omega, where omega is a closed one form with two pi z periods. So there's a lattice of those. That's this lattice here. And so we're defining a vector space here, 2G plus n dimensional vector space, by a 2G plus n dimensional lattice. And the symplectic form is also a lot easier. So, so instead of working with homotopy, I can work with homology. And so I can choose a standard homology basis. So if I present the surface as the surface of a handle body, as I always do when I draw a surface on a, on a blackboard, 
then I can choose A1 here, B1 here, A2 here, B2 here, AG here, BG here. Okay, and my holonomies around the A cycles is equal to E to the I theta I. I is going from 1 up to G. I guess I've put the, let's put the punctures to 0 now. And um, E to the I phi I is the integral of I, integral of BI, A. Okay, and now uh, it actually it's much easier just to work out the symplectic form from this formula. And what you get, plug it in, it's just kappa over pi times the sum from i equals 1 to g of d, phi, uh, d theta i, d phi i. Okay? That's a really explicit, simple, symplectic form on a 2G dimensional torus. Okay? And we're going to quantize that. In fact, I think we just barely have time to do the first and simplest example. Are there any questions? All right, so let's, let's do sort of the simplest possible thing. Let's consider flat U1 connections on the torus. So our torus, our donut, is uh, R2 divided by Z plus Z. So it's got two coordinates identified sigma i with sigma i plus 1, i equals 1 and 2. All right, so we're identifying opposite sides of a rectangle. So here's our A cycle, here's our B cycle. So we have U1 equals E to the I A1 is E to the I integral of A of the, uh, sorry about the notation, that's why I chose alpha and beta in the notes, alpha and beta cycles. And U2 is E to the I A2, E to the I integral over the beta of A. All right, so little a1 and little a2, those are like my thetas and phis. So they're identified with a1, a2, plus 2 pi, OK? So a1 and a2, those are the holonomies. They're only a defined modulo 2 pi. The holonomy is really an element of u1. The uh, flat gauge field is just a, capital A, equals a1 d sigma 1 plus a2 d sigma 2. A1 and A2 are constant, so that's my flat gauge field. What's my symplectic form? Omega is kappa over pi dA1 wedge dA2. Okay? So I have a, so there's another torus. Let me stress that. So we're doing flat gauge fields on this torus. This is the sigma torus. So this is sigma 1 and sigma 2. But M flat is itself a torus. So it's also a torus with um, A1 and A2, but it's a different torus. In some sense, it's a dual torus. Okay, certainly conceptually, it's a different torus. And it's got a symplectic form on it. All right, so, well, we can keep going. We can quantize this. We have A1 hat and A2 hat equals minus I pi over kappa. That's my commutator. And now, well, how are we going to quantize? Any suggestions? So this is my phase space. So this torus of flat U1 gauge fields, this is my space of P's and Q's. How am I going to quantize? I need to I need a Hilbert space on which a1 hat and a2 hat act as operators, right? 
why a1? Okay, the answer was L2 functions of a1. Why not a2? Who says a1 is better than a2? Okay, so there's an important point there. So there's no canonical choice of whose coordinate and who is momenta. You could have chosen A1 as coordinate and A2 as momentum. You could have chosen A2 as coordinate, A1 as momentum. After all, you could have made a symplectic transformation This is in SP2R. And chosen A1 prime as coordinate, A2 prime as momentum. Now, remember that the A1s and A2s are periodic. So you can't use any old SP, SP2R transformation. That would, that would spoil the periodicities. So actually, you have to do SP2Z transformations. But still, there's this whole choice. So it shouldn't matter which one we choose as coordinate and which one we choose as momentum. So let's, let's take the suggestion from the audience. So let's take, let's take A1 is coordinate and A2 is momentum. More precisely, uh, P uh, sorry, I'm going to choose the opposite one because that's what's in my notes. <laughs> Makes the point. Okay, so PA2 is kappa over pi A1 is the conjugate momentum to A2. Okay, it's not exactly A1, it's kappa over pi. Okay, now there's, there's an interesting point here, okay? So A1, both coordinates and momenta are quantized, are periodic, periodic. So if you, have, if you have periodicity in position, that implies you have quantization in momentum. But we also have periodicity in momentum. So that implies we should have quantization in position. Okay? So both momentum and position need to be quantized here. All right? So what we should get is A2 is not going to live on a circle. That's periodicity and, and position. It's got to live on a discrete approximation to a circle. And so we should expect to get the quantum mechanics of a particle on a discrete approximation to a circle, Zn inside U1. That's what we should expect. Now let's derive it. Two minutes over, but let's, uh, I'm almost there. So, so our wave functions are psi of A2, okay? They're 2 pi periodic in A2. But we also have to have e to the minus i 2 kappa A2 times psi equals psi of A2 because of periodicity and momentum. So this is the right factor for translating the momentum around one period. But what does this mean? This means that psi has to be a sum of delta functions. Okay, the psi n's, these are just complex numbers, these, uh, oops, complex numbers. Okay, so what I get is indeed a particle on z mod 2 kappa z. So that's my Hilbert space. Okay? It's got these two kappa coordinates. So the Hilbert space is isomorphic to the complex numbers to the two kappa. 
So that's the very explicit quantization when the surface is the simplest case. The surface is a torus, and we have the group U1. And we get two kappa states. We have a degeneracy of states on that, on that, uh, in that Hilbert space. All right, so let's stop there. back at 1045.